Okay, hi, this is Ward Silver in Zero AX. I'm going to talk to you about grounding and bonding for home HF stations, and uh, we'll also talk about mobile HF stations. Glad to be here at Com Academy. I've spoken several times to Com Academy in the past. Um, I'd like to thank Contest University and ICOM America for originally sponsoring the presentation of this talk. So let's move right through. What are the goals of the session? We're going to understand what grounding and bonding mean. We're going to appreciate the different requirements for AC safety, lightning protection, and RF. We'll discuss issues and techniques for home HF stations and special issues that apply for mobile stations. And the idea is to see how a common system satisfies all of these requirements. So you're not building three different systems all the time. And then at the very end, uh, there are comprehensive resources that will be provided on the PDF version of the slide. So you don't have to write down everything in your notes right now. The talk is aimed at home HF station owners who are building a new station perhaps or upgrading a small station or they added an amplifier and uh, suddenly have some issues or want to avoid the issues. Maybe you live in lightning country. I know Western Washington is not particularly big on lightning, but we go over the mountains to the dry side or you live someplace else in the country, Mr. Lightning may be part of your life. And perhaps you're trying for better performance on your station and you'd like to check out this grounding and bonding business. Also, if you're a mobile HF station owner, and maybe you're installing a new station, you wanna learn about uh, power wiring issues, equipment bonding, antenna and feed line stuff, and dealing with RFI and noise is always of interest to mobile station owners. Your ham radio references here are the ARRL handbook and the ARRL antenna book, both of which have substantial sections on uh, safety and uh, grounding and bonding. Also, the National Electrical Code Handbook, which is available at your library. Now, I'm not talking about the National Electrical Code itself, which is a rather small volume full of rules, uh, but I'm talking about the, the handbook, which is a large book, and it has rationale and pictures and all sorts of things that tell you how to do the different stuff that it expects you to do. And these are available for free. You can get copies used online. Any recent edition will be reasonably up to code, or you can just go to the library and copy the sections that you need. There are also three articles for free in um, QST that were published on the ARL website. They were uh, Lightning Protection for the Amateur Station Parts 1, 2, and 3 by Ron Block, NR2B, in there in uh, July, June, and August of uh, 2002 QST. K9YC.com, uh, Jim has written several tutorials, Power Grounding, Bonding, and Audio for Amateur Radio, and the other one is RFI, Ferrites, and Common Mode Chokes, both excellent, available for free, along with a lot of other interesting uh, documents there. And a couple of websites, W8JI, Tom lives on a mountaintop in uh, Georgia with a 300-foot tower, and he knows a lot about lightning for some reason, and mobile stations, your go-to site is the K0BG site, k0bg.com. Also, there's this book, uh, Grounding and Bonding for the Radio Amateur, that came out a few years ago and seems to be well regarded. It covers uh, a lot of this material, AC wiring, lightning protection, RF management, and tries to get all of the basic information in one volume, so you don't have to read 800 different books was reviewed by a number of really good experts, including the ARL Lab, and um, they uh, were instrumental in making it a very valuable uh, reference. And there's a lot of examples for you to use. So a lot of the material in this talk is coming out of this book. So let's start with what is ground anyway. Um, it's a word that gets used a lot, but it has different meanings. It could be a noun, meaning uh, a ground connection, ground. It's an earth connection. Uh, that's typically the AC or lightning context. It can be just a local reference voltage or potential. That's when you talk about it from the perspective of circuits or uh, RF stuff. It could be a verb. I'm going to ground something. That means an action to connect to that reference potential. And it can be an adjective. 
like a type of connection, um, ground wire, ground system. And it can mean all of these things at the same time. So you hear sentences like, I'm grounding the chassis to ground with the ground wire. And the same word has different meanings of uh, each point. So it's important to uh, understand what the context is uh, when you use that word. Also, uh, when we talk about ground, we have to remember that the earth is not some kind of magic sink into which RF can be poured and it just suddenly magically safety safely disappears. Same with lightning. And um, it's also the same for a vehicle body. It's not some magical zero volt thing. It's a very dynamic uh, system in and of itself. And there's some fuzzy definitions. We hear a lot about RF ground and really there ain't no such thing. Um, we'll talk about why, but um, RF ground is sort of a a uh, floating concept that works on some frequencies and some bands and sometimes, and it really is sort of misleading. So I try not to use it. Ground loops. Um, ground loops are a big deal for electricians and maybe the audio guys, but at RF, it's not the problem that you think it is. So I uh, try not to use that term, or if I do, um, I qualify exactly what I'm talking about. And then Single point ground. Well, what does single point ground mean? It depends. It depends on what frequency you're talking about. Uh, down at 60 hertz, um, something electrically small can be hundreds of thousands of meters in size, whereas you get up to two meters for something to be electrical small, electrically small and be a single point ground, then you are talking about something in a range of centimeters. So you uh, tend to be very careful when you use that word is what you mean. What is bonding anyway? Bonding is only a connection intended to keep two points at the same voltage, not at different voltages, the same voltage. When you bond stuff together, the reason is you want everything to go up and down together in voltage. It may not be zero volts with respect to something, but it's going to be the same voltage. Bonding prevents shock hazards caused by voltage differences. It prevents destructive lightning surges um, caused by light, uh, well, destructive voltage differences caused by lightning, and it limits the current between the device caused by voltage differences. What causes current flow? Voltage differences. And current is what causes RFI and uh, does other damage. So by minimizing the voltage difference, you also minimize the current. Bonding sounds hard. It's not. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how you do it in this talk. It sounds expensive. It's not. You can make it expensive, but it doesn't have to be. But it does require the right uh, connecting materials and hardware. So you want to understand what you're trying to accomplish by bonding so that you use the right stuff and do it right so it works the way you expect. And when it does work the way you expect, it's working in your favor for all the different requirements, AC safety, lightning protection, and RF management. For bonding to work, if you're gonna make it work, it has to be low impedance, so it doesn't add impedance to the circuit or the uh, connection, and it has to be short, meaning electrically short, at the frequencies of interest. And we talked about how at 60 hertz, where the uh, wavelength is something like 50 million meters short can be the size of a football stadium. And at um, uh, two meters, 20 meters, 40 meters short is a lot smaller. Otherwise, it starts to act like a transmission line and you don't want that. The bonding connector has to be heavy enough to carry the expected current. If you're talking about AC safety, it has to be heavy enough to carry any short circuit currents. If you're talking about lightning, it has to carry any lightning surge without damage, without uh, pulling itself away from the connection, all that kind of stuff. And it has to be sturdy enough to survive the environment. A lot of these conductors are buried or they're uh, laid out along a foundation or between systems and maybe they're outside, maybe they're exposed. And so they have to be heavy to be sturdy. You have a too small conductor and it's buried in your yard and you get the shovel out um, or the rototiller, don't ask how I know this, um, and you cut through it, you might not even notice, and then you don't have a connection anymore. So it has to be sturdy enough to survive 
all the mechanical insults that come along with being outdoors or exposed. For the ham station inside, you want to use strap, 20 gauge solid strap or heavy wire. That number 14 Romex that you've collected for years and years because you can't throw anything away just like me. That's a perfect uh, use for it here is for bonding conductors. It's great. You use flat weave tin braid if the equipment's going to move around. Um, mobile stations have a special um, thing to worry about. Whoop, got a little help from my kitty there. Let's see here. Whoop. There we go. Flat weave tin braid is used if the equipment moves around, especially in mobile stations. Um, and you've seen it, it's silvery color, it's uh, heavy, it's dense. Um, but don't use the braid from old coax because the minute you take it out of the jacket, it begins to deteriorate. It's not made for that. And so it wicks up moisture and chemicals and starts deteriorating. As long as it's shiny and copper, it's kind of okay. But once you take it out of the jacket and all those wires start to loose up, um, it's, it's starting to look less and less like a nice big braid and more and more like a bunch of wires with poor connections between them. Always, no matter what you use braid for, protect it from moisture and chemicals. Braid should really not be used where it can get wet. Although in mobile applications, there's not much you can do about it. About all you can do is protect it and check on it from time to time. AC safety grounding. It has several names. Um, equipment ground, third wire ground, green wire ground. The current standard term is equipment ground. And that's the third wire that goes back to your AC service box. You need to keep your ground connections low resistance. That's the most important thing. Uh, the frequency is so low that inductance is not really a problem. Um, the important thing is to be able to carry the heavy currents that come with faults like so short circuits. The, there are two reasons to have AC safety ground, just two. It provides a path to AC common for fault currents like shorts or leakage current from poor insulation or bypass capacitors or filters. It also stabilizes the AC power system voltage. You go out and you look at your ground rod, there may be one or two ground rods connected to your house and go over to the pole where you get your power from and you'll see a uh, ground rod there or maybe just a butt wrap where the wire goes around the pole as uh, it's buried. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these contacts. They're not particularly good. Any one particular butt wrap or ground rod has its limits. But when you have thousands and thousands of them, that helps stabilize the power voltage when there's a fault, such as an auto accident or a windstorm or something falls in uh, on the power lines and causes a short circuit. So there's only two reasons, and that's to carry the fault current back to the common point and stabilize power system. Here's what it looks like. You have a center tap transformer out at your pole. Um, out come two heavy black lines there. It's like a center tap transformer, just like anything um, in your equipment with uh, two phases of AC voltage and a center tap is your neutral. You can see the ground connection here. I'll move my cursor around, see the ground connection uh, there at the pole. Here comes your neutral connection. It comes into the AC service entry panel. Take off the front panel, look at all the scary stuff where the uh, wires are. You'll see two buses. One is your neutral bus where all the white wires connect. One is your ground bus where all the green or uh, bare wires connect. If this is your primary service entrance. You'll also see a wire that goes between them. The ground bus is connected to the metal of the box and that is connected outside to your grounding electrode conductor, and that's one or two ground rods outside the house. This is everything in your panel there is your AC service common point. And that's what is the reference voltage for your AC power system, and that's what you're trying to get uh, fault currents to flow back to. If you're not real sure that you know what you're doing uh, with electrical wiring, and I think we could, most of us uh, could run a branch circuit or perhaps uh, even wire up light switches and things like that. I draw the line at th three-way switches. If you don't 
are, if you're not an expert, then you really need to get a how-to reference. And this one is a very good one. There are several out there, but this costs less than $20. It's available online and at the big box stores, and it covers a lot of situations that are uncommon for those of us who aren't electricians. Especially follow the rules for subpanels and outbuildings because you can create an electrocution hazard very easily by improper grounding. And then finally, if you do any significant work, why don't you hire a pro electrician or an inspector to come over and um, and take a look over your shoulder and see if you did it right and point out things that might be a hazard or might cause a fire. You might even hire an electrician to do it. And remember that your local code, your local building code is the law and you're required to follow that. And uh, your insurance company may be unhappy if you have a problem and you wired stuff up that wasn't according to code. So remember that the code's not there to make your life miserable. It's there to make your life longer and not burn your house down. Let's talk about lightning protection. You can't steer lightning. It comes from thousands and thousands of feet in the air, and it's already pretty much decided where it's going to go by the time it gets down to us, but you can help it make good decisions. So what does Mr. Lightning want? Mr. Lightning wants a heavy, direct path to the earth to dissipate the charge out into the ground. That's what he wants. Give it to him. And for lightning, which is a uh, DC, it starts at DC, but it goes all the way up into the RF spectrum. There's a lot of lightning energy up to 10 megahertz or so, and even farther beyond that. That's why you can hear it on a VHF receiver. So inductance becomes much more important than resistance. Why is inductance more important? Because the reactance of an inductor is proportional to frequency and um, the voltage that is created is proportional to the rate of change of current. So the faster current is changing, and the more current you have changing, the higher the voltage across an inductance. Now, when you start getting hit by a big lightning pulse that's kiloamps and changing in microseconds, um, then it doesn't take very many nano henrys to create a lot of voltage. Under a typical lightning strike, even a one foot piece of number 12 wire can develop almost a thousand volts from one into another. That's just a straight piece of wire. So inductance is important. All of the paths that you provide for lightning should be outside your residence. Don't invite Mr. Lightning inside. Have it disperse into the ground outside your house and don't make it easy for lightning to go through your station or your house on its way to the earth. Don't run these paths through your call, crawl space. Don't run them through your station. And you wanna bond all earth connections together. Anything outside your house that's connected to the earth that's an electrical connection must, the word is shall in the NEC, be bonded together. So if you have an electrical panel, of course you do, and it's got a ground rod outside, maybe you've also got a telephone service and that person comes and they hook it up and they're required to have a ground connection, so they put in a ground rod. Same for the cable TV or satellite. They put in a ground rod and then you put up an antenna on your roof and you follow the NEC requirement and you run your wire down to a ground rod. Okay, all those ground rods are outside. Are they all connected together? Yeah, but by what? They're connected together with dirt. Okay, dirt is not very good at conducting electricity. If you measured with a voltmeter between these two ground rods from point A to point B, you might measure 10 ohms, 25 ohms, 100 ohms. If you're talking about lightning surge currents and thousands of amps, that can cause thousands of volts between your ground connections. And that's when you get destructive voltage surges and arcs between the television and the telephone system or between the AC electrical panel, something else, or maybe your radio station. So by bonding everything together outside, remember it doesn't have to be expensive, but you do have to do it right. Run some number six AWG between these ground rods and clamp them or weld them or whatever. And that's buried too. You create what's called a perimeter ground. Sometimes it's called a ground ring if it goes all the way around the building. But by creating this big ground outside, you have Mr. Lightning dispersing into the earth. You give Mr. Lightning what he wants outside your house. That's a perimeter ground. Let's take an example here. You've got a tower or some kind of external antenna and lightning strikes it or strikes something nearby. 
here comes the current, flows down your tower. Remember, we talked about inductance. A tower has inductance. It's going to be a lot of voltage, going to be a lot of current. And then it flows on your feed lines over the house. And maybe you created a very nice entry panel with some lightning protectors there like you're supposed to. Well, lightning surge gets to that point and it says, okay, well, here's one connection to the earth. But look, there's another really good connection to the earth. I just go through this radio stuff and the through the branch circuit over to my AC service entry ground over here on the other side of the house. And so you've got big currents not only flowing uh, to the ground outside your radio station, but through your station, through the AC service, and then over to the ground run. Obviously, that's going to cause a lot of damage. So you don't want low impedance pass through your station. What you do instead is you create this perimeter ground or a station lightning protection ground outside, bonded to the tower, bonded to your AC service entry, all of the services that go into your house and your radio stuff. And then when the lightning comes and it flows, say this time it comes to your AC service entry, it looks at the perimeter ground and it says, wow, that's really a great connection to the earth. Almost all of that lightning is going to go that way and surge out into the earth. Um, some may still go through the house. Current is just like any other current. It will look at the different impedances of the different branches available to it. Most of it will flow through the lowest impedance branch, but some still goes through the high impedance stuff. What you're trying to do is limit the current pass through your house. Out at the tower, uh, let's look down on a tower from the top. You may have seen a drawing like this in the uh, ARL handbook or antenna book. Down at the bottom of the tower, um, it's in a concrete tower base, which is a ground connection in and of itself. And then each tower leg is bonded to a uh, ground rod. And then each one of the ground rods is connected by this ground ring around your tower with, made out of heavy wire. And then if you want to really do the job, as long as you've got the backhoe out there digging uh, the hole, uh, have it dig 30-foot trenches out from your tower and extend that ground connection out another 30 feet into the yard or whatever it is and put in some more ground rods. So you've got an extended buried radial wire, and that really helps. If you talk to the monopole guys that uh, work for cellular, they'll tell you that radials really, really help disperse that lightning out into the soil. You also want to bond your feed lines to the tower every 50 feet. The inductance of that tower, when it gets hit by a lightning surge, can generate enormous voltages. So you might have 100,000 volts between the top and the bottom of your tower, uh, just a 60, 50 foot tower. So you wanna bond your feed lines to the tower every 50 feet so they're at the same voltage, the same potential. Remember, bonding is making everything go up and down together. So you don't have big voltages between the tower and your coax because uh, it'll arc through the coax to get to the tower, ruin the coax, uh, let the water in, all sorts of things. And so there are brackets and special hardware that you can get, it's not that expensive, to mount on your tower and then connect your feed lines to it. If you've got an insulated base tower, you can also put in a spark gap. Um, you can use uh, very simple things to create spark gaps and that's covered in the book. Now you also want to, where the feed lines and everything comes into your house, the best way to do protection is to create what's called a single point ground panel. And by single point, in this case, we're talking about AC safety, where the uh, wavelength is very long. We're talking about lightning, which goes up to 10 uh, megahertz or so. And then we're talking about RF, uh, which for ham radio can go up to many megahertz. Okay, so single point means electrically small. That means it's all going to be together on the panel, metal panel that's uh, mounted outside the residence. Usually, there are exceptions, but for the purpose of this talk, we're talking about where the stuff comes into your house. You create a protected side and an unprotected side. Unprotected is where everything comes in from the outside. Your data or phone service, your rotators or control lines, all the feed lines, including receiving antennas and TV antennas, and an AC branch circuit that supplies your station. What, you have to run AC power to this too? Yes, you do, because remember, you want 
everything to go up and down together. You don't want all of your RF stuff going up and down together and then having your AC not follow it because then you've got giant destructive voltages between your AC power and your lightning protected stuff. So you wanna put all of these protectors on one panel outside your house. That panel is then bonded, nice heavy conductor here, to your perimeter or lightning ground system that's outside the house. And then all of these protected items here, your feed lines, your rotator, your control, your data, all this stuff, your AC power and the station ground, all of those go to your station. These feed lines here, all this stuff, they're protected. So you wanna keep the protected stuff away from the unprotected stuff. Keep it neat and tidy uh, so that the lightning will not jump between cable bundles. It'll come up, it'll go to your panel, the lightning will go through the protectors to the ground system, and the signals go through to your station. Here's the typical examples of what's on the uh, single point ground panel. Up at the upper left is a uh, protected line duplex outlet, uh, better known as a surge protector. Uh, it's made by Isobar. Uh, it's an Isobar brand made by Triplight. And you can buy these in, in various configurations and energies. And you mount one of these on your single point ground panel and plug in basically big heavy extension cords that go back and run your station. Down at the bottom are uh, protective uh, devices for your coax lines, antenna protectors, or lightning suppressors, or lots of different names for them. Uh, basically, you screw on a RF uh, connector on either side, and they have a gas discharge tube inside. There are two different kinds of these things. Some of them have a series capacitor that blocks uh, DC from going through them. And they do that because the capacitor will cause the voltage to rise faster, cause the gas discharge tube to arc over quicker, and that prevents lightning energy from getting to your equipment. It also prevents bias power and uh, preamp power from going out the coax. So if you're using the coax to power a preamp or an antenna switch, uh, don't buy the DC blocking ones because suddenly your stuff outside won't work. Don't ask me how I learned that. Um, so there are two different kinds, make sure you get the right one. And up at the right is a typical device that's used for control lines or phone lines. You can see little things that look like capacitors. Those are MOVs. The little barrels are gas discharge tubes and other things. And there's all kinds of variations of these devices, but these all mount on your single point ground panel. Here's an example of a single point ground panel that I installed at the base of a tower. Um, you can see the big cable. That's a buried piece of hard line that goes uh, toward the station. Here are three coaxes that all go to different antennas. You can see in the back here, the big heavy ground wire. And my panel here is just a piece of aluminum flashing. And this is mounted on a small piece of board inside a fiberglass, uh, surplus fiberglass electrical box. And um, so all of this doesn't have to be all that expensive. What's mounted on this panel is my antenna switch. And here is a terminal strip each one of these little things is a gas discharge tube, and this is my rotator control line. And here, I'll save you some money. I used direct berry, 10 conductor, uh, number 18 irrigation cable, irrigation system control cable. You can buy it for way cheaper than the fancy, fancy rotator um, control cable. You double up a couple of pairs of this stuff and use that for your solenoid circuit, pins one and two typically, and the rest of it is uh, is perfect for rotator uh, motor and uh, direction circuits. And each one has a gas discharge tube to protect it, and then um, uh, off it goes. Here's another single point ground panel. This is from K4RO. Kirk lives on a hilltop near Nashville and was losing a lot of equipment to lightning, and so he created a giant um, uh, single point ground panel in his garage. His station is right above this up here someplace. So here's the big panel and he mounted everything associated with his antenna system on it, his filters, his switches, um, all this kind of stuff. Here's the big connection from his ground connection outside. 
And since he's put this up, he hasn't lost any equipment because all of the voltage on that stuff goes up and down together on that panel. Here's a couple of uh, more single point ground panels. This is in my station. Um, I have a rack cabinet and I have two different operating positions, one and two. Everything on here has its own little uh, piece of flashing and the flashing connects to this rack. You can see this down here in the back. You can see a copper wire over here that goes to one of the stations. There's another one over here. This is where I mount all of my protective stuff or inside the station. It's all connected to the rack. The rack acts like one big single point panel. And then I've got one wire here, one heavy number six wire that goes outside to my perimeter ground. Just buy a spool of number six AWG, it's not that expensive. It's a standard stuff that all of the electrical contractors use. So it's got the volume cost that you can take care of. Okay, lightning protection. If you read Ron Block's uh, 2002 QST articles, he talks about a protected zone. And uh, you can see that over at the right, that's what the red line is. The protected zone is everything you want to protect uh, from lightning. So anything crossing that boundary line, every cable, every power cord uh, has to be protected somehow, either through a surge protector or a lightning arrestor or something like that. And then everything inside that red line has to be bonded if it's inside your station. So by bonding things together, so they go up and down together and you protect everything that goes across the boundary that creates a protected zone. Read those articles for a complete discussion about that. Let's talk a little bit about RF management. Everything in your station is an antenna. That's the first thing to remember. And I mean everything, everything in there, um, all of the cables, all of the wires and ground stuff and everything else, it's right in the near field of your antenna. If you've got a 40 meter dipole in your backyard, what's the wavelength of 40 meters? It's 40 meters. So that's 120 feet. Everything within 120 feet of that antenna is in the near field of that antenna. And the near field actually goes out quite a bit longer than that. So everything in your station is exposed to pretty strong RF fields and it's going to pick it up. So forget about an RF ground uh, because the station is not symmetrical, uh, symmetrical with respect to where the antenna is. It's going to have different field strengths in different places at the antenna. So creating a zero volt uh, RF potential is just not going to work very well. You need to con concentrate instead on bonding. You're not going to create zero volts. You're going to create the same voltage. So you don't have voltage differences. Keep your connections electrically short. Short. And that's how you tie everything together. And you don't have to worry about an RF ground. It just keeps everything at the same voltage. If you have an amplifier, you have extra high RF field strength, and it requires uh, extra attention to the bonding. So you put an amplifier in there and you light it up, uh, you're going to find the weak spots in your bonding right away. So to help you bond everything together, you create a common reference plane, RF reference plane, RF ground plane, or a bus, and you tie everything to that. You've seen this picture probably in the handbook or license manuals. Um, by bonding everything together using a bus or uh, some other equivalent, you eliminate these RF hotspots that are always seem to be at the end of the microphone connector so you get bit on your nose. It also reduces audio buzz and hum that uh, are caused by voltage differences between equipment. And that's important since we're doing that with digital signals. It also reduces RFI from common mode current flowing between pieces of equipment. It's the current that causes the problem. Why does current flow? Because you have a voltage difference. By making the voltages the same, you reduce greatly the amount of RF current that's going to flow between pieces of equipment. And that also reduces sensitivity to physical configuration of the equipment, so you don't have to rearrange things to work on certain bands or all this kind of stuff. Bond everything together so it goes up and down together. You also want to use short or coiled cables. And when you coil a cable up, I just got a great tip from a lightning guy. He said, wind it up as a figure eight. Get one of those kite string things and wind it up like that. 
uh, that tends to cancel out the inductance so it doesn't act like a, an open air winding of a transformer to pick up energy from a magnetic field. Use short cables so that they don't pick up, and they pick up the minimum amount of RF. Use a bonding bus or a reference plane under your equipment so that you have this common uh, conductor between them all. You minimize loop area. Remember, we talked about ground loops a little bit. Any closed path between equipment that you can flow around from one piece of equipment to the other and come back, that's a ground loop. And if you look at any, even a small station, you have dozens. And in a big station, you'll have hundreds of ground loops. You're not going to get rid of them. All you can do is short them out by bonding. You minimize your area, you minimize the amount of current and voltage that are going to be picked up, and then you use bonding to short them out. Always use shielded cables, even for DC power if you can, although the DC power cables that come to our radios are not shielded but they are very well bypassed and filtered in the radios. Use short straps or wires when you connect things to the uh, bonding system. So strap and wire. Here's an example. Here's a, one of my operating positions. It's got a couple of radios on it. You can see the aluminum flashing that's attached to the Costco table there. And all the cables lay on that flashing and they're all connected. All the radios and gadgets are connected to that bus in the back. And that's connected to the single point ground in the in the rack. Remember for your ground system, now that you've created a ground system for AC safety, lightning, and RF management, all currents flow on all wires. The, the AC current doesn't just flow on the AC ground wire. It'll flow on everything. Same for lightning, same for RF. So that's why you create one system for them all. One system to rule them all. It may, if it's made of short, heavy, direct connections, it can satisfy all of those requirements. And the perimeter ground helps keep lightning outside. That works in your favor, a perimeter ground system and a solid bonding in your shack. Let's talk about, let's skip over to the mobile station here. RF issues can be more intense in the mobile station because you're basically sitting in your antenna uh, ground plane. And so, the, all the wiring is exposed. It's right there. You've got your equipment in it. So you've got to pay more attention to RF management in a vehicle station. You also have special power wiring conditions, uh, considerations in a mobile station. You've got bonding uh, to worry about in the vehicle body. How, how can you use that? And then you've got to mount your antennas right on your ground plane. So let's talk about some of these. For mobile power, your primary uh, concern is fusing ampacity, meaning the uh, ability to carry current and voltage drops around the system. We've also got power return wiring, and uh, most modern vehicles have a battery monitoring system, so we're going to talk about that. Then you've got RF pickup issues on the power, and there's these things called DC to DC boosters that are available. Uh, some come with your car, new cars anyway, and uh, you might want to add one uh, to run your equipment. Fusing. Fuses in both leads, always, no exceptions, because uh, you don't want some other fault in the system, some other piece of equipment, to suddenly short circuit and decide that your radio is the best, best path back to the battery. You always want fuses in both leads, always. And you have to have adequate rating of your power connections. The power sockets that we used to call cigarette lighters uh, now are called vehicle power, auxiliary power, whatever. These are not sufficient. They're rarely rated at more than 7 to 10 amps, and they will not run a transceiver very long. Um, your power wiring has to be adequately sized. You need to figure out what your maximum resistance is by, by dividing your maximum allowable voltage drop by the maximum current that you're going to draw. If you decide, I want half a volt of voltage drop in my power wiring, and I'm going to be drawing 25 amps, that means I can have 0 0.02 ohms in my power wiring. And that means if you've got a 20-foot run, that means 10 foot out and 10 foot back, that means you've got to have number 10 wire or bigger. And so don't forget that mobile radios need at least 11 volts and usually more or they start acting funny. So uh, don't forget your connector resistance. That's also part of the deal. 
And when you do connect your power return, this is important. It's not too hard to figure out that maybe I'm going to connect directly to the battery or I'm going to connect to a ham gear DC to DC booster. But where does the power return go? Uh, you have to look at the battery. Now, those of us that are of a certain age learn to connect everything directly to the battery. And so we'd shove our terminals right in the connector there. But look carefully at your battery. If it has one of these things on its negative terminal, that's a battery sensor. And what it does is uh, basically measure current going through your battery connection. Do not connect upstream of that. Don't connect your radio here. Follow the cable, this heavy cable over here goes down, down, down somewhere. There's gonna be a chassis ground point. That's where you connect your power. If you don't have a battery sensor, yes, you can connect it to the negative terminal of your battery. But if you do, if you connect your radio over here, you'll upset the computer's calculations of how much current's going in and out of your battery, and it won't be able to tell uh, what the state of charge of your battery is. That's very important on vehicles that have the uh, ability to turn the engine off and then back on when you come to a stop sign so you're not idling all the time. Uh, they depend on that battery monitoring system to maintain the battery. Uh, so make sure that you know if you've got one of these, connect it to the major chassis ground point where the starter motor and other heavy systems connect. To manage the RF pickup issue, twist the wires together. I know they come in this nice little zip cord thing, but uh, if you really wanna balance those wires and minimize the amount of RF that you pick up, twist them together. Just put one end in a vise and the other end in a drill and slowly twist them until you get a few turns per foot. That will shorten the cable a little bit, so make sure you've got enough wire. And if you do put ferrite cores um, at on the cables to minimize RF pickup, the place to put a ferrite core on your power wiring is right here, right at the radio. Okay, so when you connect your DC return down here, whether it's to a booster or a chassis or, or a just straight connection, that's called home run wiring. Um, and what you want to do is when you have um, a DC to DC booster, you want to have home run wiring. When you want to add one of these battery levelers or whatever they call them, the positive goes to the battery, the negative will go here to the chassis ground point. Do not use the vehicle boosters for your ham gear. First of all, they're not rated uh, to provide 20 to 25 amps uh, worth of power for 100 watt radio. And um, they also calculate how much voltage uh, out the rest of the subsystems need. They don't know about your radio, so those calculations are all screwed up. So put on a separate DC to DC booster for your vehicle. Okay, let's talk about bonding in mobile stations. Body components are not always well bonded together. Your cab in a, in a truck is not always bonded well to the, the bed. The different pieces of the car are not always well bonded together. They may not even be metallic. Okay, so it's not as easy as just finding a body screw someplace and using that as your return point. Don't use the frame as your DC ground. Always run the power home run wiring. Okay, and don't use subsystem ground points such as for the headlights, or the computer or something, you look at it and you go, wow, there's a great ground connection. Don't use it because it will upset the subsystems because your radio is going to inject 10 to 20 amps into that. And when the subsystems themselves turn on and off, you can get weird DC voltage drops from that point that act like RF interference and upset your radio and can be very hard to isolate. Home run wiring back to the battery. Uh, and don't forget that when you do bond to the, the body, even if it's metallic, it creates new DC return and RF pass. So you have to be ready to deal with those. And wherever you connect to your vehicle, protect your connections with anti-corrosion compound. When you're mounting equipment in the vehicle, here's an example of someone who's mounted an HF transceiver and some other stuff to the back of their passenger compartment in what looks like a pickup truck, something back there. They found that metal panel and they bolted it right to it. They've got a big, heavy aluminum panel and everything's tied to that. Okay, first of all, don't forget that a single piece of gear, like a transceiver, 
doesn't need to be connected to anything. It doesn't have to be bonded. Um, that includes your VHF, UHF mobile, and your HF uh, gear. The body panel that you connect to is part of the antenna system. So you've created these extra RF paths. You have to be aware of that. You might consider a sub-panel mount. Just create a big, heavy panel, mount your stuff on that, and mount that to the vehicle in some way that's not electrically connected. That'll isolate it. And whenever you take a control head off a radio and put it someplace, don't bond the control head to the body. It's not designed for that, and you'll create some really interesting misbehavior if you do. Another thing to consider would be use one of the standalone mini racks or maybe one of these carry kits. Put your whole station in this independent thing where it's all bonded together inside the, the case or the rack, and then you can take the whole thing in and out of your vehicle. This is a communications academy where you get deployed a lot. You might want to take your equipment with you in the vehicle, and then when you get to wherever you're going, take it out and set it up. Uh, this does lead to security issues. It's something that can be grabbed. Uh, you got to deal with that. Uh, but uh, basically, there's no need for a vehicle bond for this stuff. Okay, mechanical security, you've got to tie this stuff down. You don't want it flopping around in your vehicle. Not only is it inconvenient, but if there's an accident, uh, you can be killed by a heavy transceiver flying around in your vehicle, hitting you in an unpleasant spot. So make sure you tie this stuff down. I know we've all done it, taking a little transceiver and stuff it in between the seat uh, and the console. Just don't do that. Also watch out for airbags, they are everywhere. And when you mount equipment over where an airbag is and the airbag blows, that equipment's going right along with it at 100 miles an hour. So don't put your equipment in front of where the airbag panels are. If you don't know where the airbag panels are, check a Chilton's manual or go see a dealer and have them identify it for you. Use the channels under your trim strips. They usually a couple of three screws come out and uh, you can run your wires under there. It shields them from direct RF pickup and it protects them. And watch out for hidden wiring. When you're drilling holes in your car, uh, make sure you know or think you know what's on the other side. Use a drill um, uh, guide or protector that limits as far as the drill bit can go in. It's sometimes just a little piece of tubing, but don't run that drill bit in two or three inches. You may find out where the 12 volt wiring is for something. When you mount the antennas, you, the only place, um, it, this is really important, is you want to make sure that there's no paint under the antenna connector, okay? You may have to sand off the paint, but a through-hole panel NMO connector is probably the best. Lip mounts need an additional bond, body bond. They have the little set screws uh, that bite through the paint, but they're not really all that great. Um, run another bonding wire to a nearby body screw. Mag mounts only have about 100 picofarads per magnet of coupling, so they don't work well at HF. Uh, that makes your coax shield the other part of the antenna, which makes RFI worse. And then you need that extra body bond wire, which also becomes part of the antenna. So I don't recommend mag mounts at HF. And then you want to decouple with uh, ferrite or body bonds at the antenna and at the radio. Check in uh, if you're buying a new car. Um, check into what's called an upfit package. And uh, salesmen may not know about it, but their fleet guys certainly do. So they're not that expensive. You can get um, a NMO connector uh, installed in a panel professionally. They'll have extra alternators, heavy duty batteries, all kinds of things. Look for that upfit package. Manufacturer service bulletins about installing radio equipment are also very good and give you a lot of guidelines. Talk to the fleet sales and maybe even the fleet resales department. Get a used fleet car. And your service department can also provide guidance. So can audio shops that have installed millions of things in cars and can give you a lot of pointers on where to run stuff and where not to run stuff. And they probably already installed radio equipment stuff too. So those are some re uh, real resources for you. So that pretty much runs through my fire hose of information here. And yes, we're done. I have provided uh, the slides as PDFs to the Com Academy folks, and uh, they'll have them available online for you. So I'd like to thank you for your attention, and we'll see you next time.